was going on inside the Birmingham Hospitals Trust. Some from allegations of whistleblowers being threatened to the father of a junior doctor who killed herself, saying that the hospital had destroyed her. And indeed, this program has played a leading role in unearthing these issues. That resulted in three inquiries being launched, the first of which, an interim report, came out today. It sought to reassure the public, saying the Trust's various sites were a safe place to receive care. But it warned any continuation of a corrosive culture there would impact morale, hit staffing and put at risk the care of patients. Today's report highlights the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, saying there's clear evidence that cultural problems persist there and require serious attention. Sir Robert Francis, the barrister who led the Mid-Staffs Hospital inquiry, tonight told Newsnight that patients will not be safe in any organisation unless the staff feel they'll be supported if they speak up about their genuine concerns. David and team have been investigating the trust since autumn. Here's his latest report from Birmingham. A culture of fear in one of England's biggest hospital trusts. Newsnight's investigation into UHB uncovered allegations of a toxic culture. What happens to Birmingham patients is just shocking. Where staff who raised patient safety concerns feared punishment. You will get punished quite quickly and quite harshly. In response to our findings, the NHS began three reviews. The first by Professor Mike Buick reported today. This sort of culture of fear, I'm afraid, is still prevalent and people are still reluctant to come forward and our review after your own news night reports has confirmed many of those fears uh, we haven't found any evidence that the trust is in disarray in terms of clinical safety but this sort of corrosive effect of an environment where people are not free to speak up or feel not free to speak up this corrosive effect will have effect on patient safety if things aren't reversed quickly in the middle of our investigation, the Trust wrote to Newsnight telling us that they would no longer be answering any of our questions. Today, though, we were invited in to speak to the acting chief executive. The report sets out some very concerning things about the culture of the organisation. What I've been doing in the last three months since becoming chief executive is getting out and speaking to as many people in the organisation as I possibly can across a whole range of different uh, professional disciplines to understand what they feel about working in the organisation and the way in which they're treated. And what I'm hearing is a range of feedback that is improving, that is proving very helpful in understanding where we need to target our efforts in order to improve the culture and improve the kind of um, uh, sense of belonging and ownership that people feel in the organisation and how they're treated. So we're, we're very committed to sorting that out. I, fully accept Professor Buick's report and all of the findings and recommendations that are made. I think that the report reflects that the organisation overall is a safe place for patients to uh, access and receive care and treatment. In 2017, Dr Manos Nicolousis, a consultant haematologist, was commissioned by the Trust to look at cases of 19 patients in the haematology department of Queen Elizabeth's Hospital who died. He found that a lack of ownership among clinicians meant that some patients died without receiving any treatment at all. So when you raise concerns... When Dr Nicolousis alerted the Trust, he told us back in November that he wasn't clear that any notice at all was taken of his warnings. There was definitely a lack of safe patient care and a lack of ownership of the patient a lack of looking after the patient the way they should look after these patients in in a very detailed way in today's report professor buick has recommended a full review of the cases concerned the response to the report was he wrote inadequate given the nature of the concerns raised and the lack of any apparent formal response or documented action arising from the findings it is not clear that relatives were informed about the review. This has all come too late, certainly, for the family of Frank Bird. He died in the haematology department of Queen Elizabeth's Hospital after a catalogue of serious mistakes, a full two years after Dr Nicolousis submitted his report. The trust has previously apologised and paid an undisclosed sum to the family. His family say he would be alive today if the trust had taken these safety concerns seriously. If they'd have took that Dr Manos's report more seriously, my dad's life could have been saved because all those things that was going wrong that he spotted, they could have been changed, they could have been put right. Something could have been done about them to stop further deaths in the hospital. I feel like I should have shouted and screamed at somebody until they listened. And you feel like you can't, can you? Because you feel like you're not I do supposed to do that. that. I did more. <laughs> all the time. And he always expected that of me because that's the way he brought me up, was to use my mouth.
and talk. And I, I didn't because doctors are higher than you and they know what they're doing. For sure they killed him and that's it. I know that. And they're not accountable because they, they've not got it now. They can do what they like and get away with it. We have apologised uh, unreservedly to the family of Mr Bird and we are deeply sorry for um, his death and the circumstances surrounding it. What we need to do is make sure that we learn when we don't get things right so that we can reduce or eliminate the chance of them happening going forwards. And there's many, many areas where we do that extremely effectively, but there's areas where we need to do it better. And what I'm committed to doing is making sure that we do it far better that we support staff to do even greater things for patients because that's what we're all about. Tristan Reuser is an eminent eye surgeon. An employment tribunal found that he had wrongly been dismissed from UHB in 2017, initially for reasons that the then medical director, David Rosser, who sacked him, either knew or should have known were false. Mr. Rosser also referred the eye surgeon to the General Medical Council for investigation. The tribunal judge was damning of this action. That referral contained a number of material inaccuracies that suggest either Dr. Rosser was deliberately misleading the GMC or, at best, that he had failed to give the matter anything like the level of care and attention required. Despite such a critical assessment of his actions, Rosser was then promoted from medical director to trust chief executive. We need uh, to, to do a, a much more forensic uh, analysis of, of the board papers at that time, the decision-making process. Um, there may have been, well be mitigation as to why that was not, why that was never in dispute, but we just don't know that. That's not something that, as the current chief executive of the organisation, I can comment back on but from you were when chief that operating happened. officer at the time. Yes. What did you think when you read that employment tribunal? I think that the employment tribunal was very clear in its findings. I think the trust responded at the time. As we were preparing our original report in November, the Trust put out a statement saying that David Rosser was leaving UHB to take up a position at the Regional Health Board. However, through an answer to a Freedom of Information request, we found that David Rosser is actually still employed by the Trust. Why did this organisation put out a press release on the 22nd of November saying that he was leaving the Trust and that he was a sad loss to the Trust when he, he's never left the Trust? He's still employed by the Trust. He's left... He's left his role as chief executive. Sure, but he hasn't left the trust, has he? He's gone on secondment to work for the Integrated Care Board. But you're still paying salary, aren't you? The NHS is responsible for... But it's coming out of your budget at this hospital. The NHS's budget, this hospital's budget, I'm really not at liberty to discuss any arrangements regarding Mr Ross's employment. Great. Sorry, just, um, <clears throat> we understand David Ross has retired. As we were recording our interview with Mr. Brotherton, there was an announcement that David Rosser had decided to retire from the NHS. Other senior executives and non-executives, though, are still in place. Dr. Nicolousis, whose safety concerns were apparently ignored, says that's not good enough. I must admit that with the current structure, I don't really think that the trust will move forward a lot. I think what the trust needs is that the trust needs new people to come in. Are you certain? as the acting chief executive, the interim chief executive of this organisation, that nobody in the current leadership management have questions about their behaviour, how they behave, whether they were perhaps over-aggressive in their dealing with people who were raising concerns. Are you clear that none of them have questions to answer on that score? If there are questions to answer, then we will answer them. As the chief executive, I will make sure that wherever in the organisation that it is perceived that we have the wrong kind of behaviours that are not in line with our trust values, then I will be dealing with that. Professor Buick says that further personnel changes at the trust may be necessary as new information emerges. Patients, though, know only too well that a diagnosis isn't the same as a cure. That report produced by Sean Clare. Well, let's talk about what happens now and in the coming months with Preet Gill, MP for Edgbaston, who is also on a local committee monitoring the ongoing inquiries. Uh, Preet Gill, thank you for joining us again on this story on Newsnight. It is an interim report, but does it confirm your fears about what's been going on at the Trust? Well, I think it's a disturbing picture of serious failings at University Hospital Birmingham. The allegations of over 50 whistleblowers from my constituency really confirm that toxic culture which is described. Professor Buick had the opportunity to meet 44 of those whistleblowers directly so that that could be fed in to this part of the first review. And clearly, that culture contributed to the tragic death 
of Dr. Kumar. And, you know, today I chaired the cross-party reference group. We heard from Dr. Buick. There are lots of questions from this uh, report. And this is the first report. Of course, it took place after six weeks. And one of the assurances we wanted from him is especially on the external reviews that he is suggesting into patient safety be carried out. When will they actually be taken about? And where does accountability actually sit? And how do we contribute to make sure that we are able to hold the trust the ICB to account to ensure that actually the confidence of the public uh, is there in terms of making sure that you know people do feel safe. I'm assured by Professor Buick's evidence today to us uh, stating that you know there, the safety issue isn't of concern. Of course, there are things that need well. to change. Now it's incumbent upon UHB to absolutely implement those recommendations. And what we've asked for is a let's, clear implementation plan. Let's pick up on that point you made a moment ago about the safety issue. I mean, it does seem reading the report that it walks a fine line. It says the trust is safe. Uh, but then it describes persistent changes, uh, failures, I beg your pardon, that need to be changed immediately or else it will be uh, or become unsafe. Um, are you convinced that they're not just trying to reassure people while si uh, simultaneously diagnosing these serious persistent problems? Well, Professor Buick faced a number of challenges and questions in respect of what you've just highlighted, especially with the excess mortality deaths. Uh, clearly, there was an issue of coding, but what Professor Buick assured us is that he has checked this out with other clinicians and he is going to monitor this because what we were really asking for, well, what are the red flags that they need to be looking for? And surely we should be commissioning that report as opposed to just monitoring and waiting. And he assured us uh, that this is something that he's absolutely looking at. But, you know, he's, he's made sure that, you know, immediate patient safety isn't a concern. You know, he has tried to address uh, many of the questions that we raised with him on, on this point because, of course, culture does mean patient safety is compromised at times uh, and hence, you know, needing the timescales of when these additional external reviews are going to take place. Uh, this is really, really important. These are answers that we want, no doubt, the public want to as well. And presumably as part of that cross-examination, you mentioned that they've got a 10% higher mortality rate than, than similar trusts. Uh, what was their response to that? I mean, did, did you find it convincing? Well, I think what Professor Buick then sort of told us was actually, you know, quite a lot of trust face this sort of issue. It's very difficult to say because, of course, he hasn't been able to look at lots of other departments. He's been concentrating some of that on the haematology uh, elements. And so given that he's going to be part of the culture-led review and he's asking subsequent questions in respect of these mortality rates, he's assured that he's able to follow those through as well. Now, I don't know how much of uh, David's latest report you heard, but he was talking to the interim CEO and at one point pointed out to him that he'd been the chief operating officer uh, for years on the board. Um, is that right, do you think, or does there need to be a clean sweep? I mean, look, this is the initial review, and there are three parts to this review. Of course, the culture review will really get to the bottom of lots of the governance issues. Now, while some non-executive directors have been replaced, what the cross-party reference group are asking uh, for is for the new chair to actually attend that cross-party reference group and give a very clear uh, idea of, of who has actually left, who is still there, and what is going to happen going forward. I have no doubt that many people will be reconsidering their positions uh, as the next part of the review takes place. We've got to have the confidence of staff because that is the only way we assure patient safety and that is the only way that we can deliver services for people in uh, the regions. Free Gill, thank you very much indeed. Well, bad news today.